Good evening, Panther Nation. It's your boy, the freaking Puerto Rican, a.k.a. Joey Riolano, here on tonight's episode of Carolina Cat mute. Chronicles. Oh, my Lord, he's on mute, folks, or I'm on mute. Um, tonight we have a very special guest, in fact. We have Draft Panther's very own editor-in-chief and founder, Scott Karasik. Um, Scott, say hello. Did you say Draft Panther's? I'm sorry, Draft Falcons, I thought I said. <laughs> I didn't hear anything. Oh, man. I was like, what? <laughs> not yeah, even didn't hear anything? Falcons it is. That's a compliment where we come from, man. That's right. That's for sure. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Um, I'm doing good tonight. I just downed some crab cakes, so I'm good to go. You are, and you're not even in Maryland. How awesome is that? And, and of course, we have Mel Mayock, a.k.a. Aaron Ford. Say hello, Aaron. Hey, Panther Nation. Glad to have you. Hey, it's been what? It's probably been a month since I've been able to be on the show. I've been traveling all over the country, but happy to be back. Looking forward to a great discussion tonight. Good, good. We are so glad you're back. You, uh, you're a very busy man, and when you're able to grace us with your presence, it certainly is a privilege. <laughs> and of course, the smooth operator. Even when he can't hear <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> Touchdown, hardly Tony Dunn. That. Hardly that tonight, fellas. Um, <laughs> hardly that. What's up? It's the professor, fellas. Sorry for the complications. They come every week, nonstop, right on time, Tuesday, 10 o'clock. I was that close, and then I realized I was talking... And you guys could hear me, and I couldn't hear you. That's how so, all right, all right. So, can you uh, catch me up on what I missed? Yes, you missed <laughs> me introducing Scott Karasik as founder of Draft Panthers. <laughs> oh, nice, nice. <laughs> Draft Panthers. He's never been complimented uh, so well in his life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Scott, did you get to tell us? Did you get to correct us? Oh, I did. I definitely okay. did. Okay. Um, All right. And he did so with the quickness. Nice, nice. Um, I was gonna jump in there if I could have heard, if I could have heard y'all, and I would have said it's our boy Scott Jurassic, not to be confused with the Cretaceous period. Um, I've got a, sorry, I've got a kid who is way into dinosaurs and he could be like, oh no, nah, that's the Mesozoic period. So I was actually going to come on with a joke tonight that said the Panthers are a more evolved animal than a falcon. And you guys must have started in the Mesozoic period and we're certainly in the Cretaceous <laughs> All right, this 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 show's gotten <laughs> off really to a weird start, right? To a weird start to tonight's show. All right, fellas, it is tonight is the Camp Chronicles. We have part one, part one of Camp Chronicles. What we're going to be doing is for the next three weeks, we're obviously going to be talking about training camp. We're obviously going to be talking about the Panthers. But for the next three weeks, what we're going to try to do is bring on uh, outside guests from a division rival because we want to know what's going on in the division because you know we're going to face these guys twice. It's who we, um, you know, it's who we look forward to the most other than Tampa Bay. I would like to know this, Scott, when, do you like, is, is our division every team but to Tampa Bay? I mean, it's pretty much like Atlanta, Carolina, New Orleans. They've played each other for, well, since Carolina came into existence, they've always played the Falcons. They've always played the Saints. Right. Since the Saints came into existence, they've always played the Falcons. The Falcons had one year where they didn't have to deal with those pesky Saints, but other than that, they've always had to deal with them. So the rivalries are as old as the teams. Right. You know? When you've played these guys two years for your entire history, like twice a year your entire history, you're kind of like, man, I kind of hate those guys. I'm tired of playing them all the time. 
that's how rivalries build. And we've got to see the Bucks for the last ten years, and it's been interesting. Um, they had their one moment. They had their one moment, and then I think in 07 they won the Division Two, but no one cared because they were like 9-7, and seven, and the entire division just kind of sucked that year. Right. Um, but no, it was... It's almost like Tampa Bay doesn't care. That's the thing. That's what... That, I mean, it's not that... The reason that... Look, the Panther fans hate the Falcons and the Saints more than anything, just like you hate the Saints and Panthers more than anything. Like, I just dis- hate the Panthers. Oh, okay. Well, I hate the Falcons, so that's okay. I guess I guess that actually sucks. That doesn't say anything good about the Panthers, because when your team hates, when your fan base hates the other team more, that's generally a bad sign that they they've gotten the best of you. You know, like, um, for instance, I got this tweet, I got a tweet yesterday, and the guy said, I didn't know Panther fans hated the Patriots that much. <laughs> and we are like, we loathe you, mother... 2003? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> everything to do with it. <laughs> it has everything to do with it. And, yeah, that's Joe, every- you, gotta, you gotta sit up, Joe. You look like we that's see why, the top That's why Falcons oh, take yeah. the Broncos so much. Like the Godfather. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so here, let me just go ahead, and before we jump into the deep topics, I'm going to go ahead and explain to Scott, because that's messed up. My man said, I don't really hate the Panthers that much. That <laughs> actually makes me more pissed at y'all. <laughs> well, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. The Panthers have lost... 23 times to the Falcons and have only beat the Falcons 15 times. The Ooh. only teams that Atlanta has a better record against are the San Diego Chargers and the Buffalo Bills. Oh, he came prepared. He did. Those are some pretty impressive numbers. Yeah, so, my, man, my man did some research. But let me go ahead and tell you something about those numbers. Mike Vick, he he's ain't a Falcon no more. Right, he's responsible for a lot of those defeats. He's really yeah, not man. responsible for a lot of them. Yes, he was, dude. I was there, man. I hate that mug. Actually, I love him now that he is a Jet and an Eagle because, look, you might not know this school, Scott, but I am an East Carolina Pirate alumni. We are about an hour and a half east of Raleigh. In the EFP between Raleigh and the Outer Banks? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I know about and and we, Chris we were the party school. Come that's on, right. Man. That's t- okay. Well, I mean, I mean, world. that's right. Best barbecue in the world. But some, I mean, you're from the East Coast, and you're from pretty close. You went to school pretty w- close, respectively. But Mike Vick played for Virginia Tech, and we played Virginia Tech every year. He was in college. So, and my man. No, nah, I think he. I think he went longer than two, didn't he? Yeah, but he redshirted his freshman year. I feel like he was there longer. It's just because he won so much. Yeah, Maybe they, that's they what it is. Almost every game he played. Yeah, he. I think he only lost two games. Maybe he lost a national championship game one year. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, he. Um, so not only did he just annihilate my college team. Like, I mean, I was at games, and my man, like, threw for 300 yards and rushed for 200 yards. It was insane. Like, he might as well have been returning putts. Um, Then the mug goes to Atlanta and does the same shit for the next four or five years to us. I mean, I hate that. I hated that dude. So when he got out of jail and went to the Eagles or whatever, I was like, Hell yeah, I love you as long as you just don't come back to the NFC South. <laughs> um, so I guess that's why. All right, Scott, just put it in perspective. The reason he doesn't really care about the Panthers is because of Mike Vick. And let's let's just put it this way too. Atlanta is seven and five in the Mike Smith there. Against the Panthers? against the Panthers. So they've still got a winning record, and that's including last year's, like, 
I hate to say it, last year's kind of like at, at that first Panther game, it was kind of when the team gave up. They were just like, ah, eh, we're good. We know we suck this year. And you can see uh, Y'all shouldn't have sucked as bad as y'all sucked, first of all. Let me just get and tell you that. You don't go whatever y'all went, like 13 and 3 or whatever it was, 12 and 4. What were you, 14 and 2 or some shit like that? What was it the year it before? 13 and 3 the year before. Yeah. You don't go 13 and 3 and then just go to be the worst team in the league just because Julio Jones is damn hurt. Sorry. Well, losing, losing Sam Baker hurts too. I don't know. Okay, well, I don't care who. I mean, that's. Y'all were not. Look, Matt Ryan, Meg Ryan, not as good. I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. Let me just say this. Is run those same exact numbers. What'd you say? The Mike. The What's his name? Seven Mike Smith. Seven and what's five. What's his name again? Last year, seven and three. Okay. What's what's Mike Smith's name? Is his name Mike Smith? Is that right? <laughs> Mike Smith. I don't yes. even know his name. Hey, you ever Smith. heard this dude? Let me let me ask you this. You ever heard my man's name, Cam Newton? What's yeah. the Cam Newton record versus the Falcons? You really want to go there? I know we won two last week. What what did he lose his first four against the Falcons? I mean, I'm just saying. Do you really want to go there? Is he is he two and four? Is he two and four against the Falcons? Two and four, or three and three. Yeah, three and I think three. we split one year. Yeah. Okay, so look, yeah, that's on, what I'm talking on, about. He's he's checking. 2011, now. 2011, right? He's three and yep. three. Yeah, three and three. And three. three. See, so the first here's the thing. thing: is you can't be just throwing out the stats when we got Jimmy Clausen as a motherfucking quarterback. Oh, you know, I mean, like, that, that is, of course, you had Jimmy Clausen for a while there, too. He yeah. took it to the Super Bowl. That was, yeah, yeah, that was when, yeah. And that was okay. even when you won the division. Atlanta still beat you one out of those two games in 08. Well, <laughs> I, let me, I will say this, too, is our division is used to splitting. You know, I mean, the thought that you're going to sweep a team in the NFC South is less likely than it is more. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, because even when Atlanta did go 13-3, and they split with everybody. Yeah. And they did, there are three losses were the Panthers, the Saints, and the, and the, uh, the, the Bucks. I still forget about them. Ten years in, I still forget about them. See? See? I'm telling you. Um, There's no rivalry. That's right. It doesn't feel like it. It doesn't feel like it. But Bucks fans are terrible. Like when you meet that like one out of twenty five fans that really cares, they're awful. They are Even when they do, they're getting right now. <laughs> there was this guy at a Falcons game dressed up like two chains. And we gave him so much help because they destroyed him. And this was in two thousand and twelve. Or no, this was 2011. They come in. They came into Atlanta. And Atlanta just destroyed them that year. It was like 41 to something against mm. the Bucks. Mm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. You know, we gave him so much crap because he looked like two chains. Well, well, one thing. All right, let's go ahead and jump right in. Then we'll jump right in. 15 minutes later, let's jump right in to this. Is that what we have concluded to this point is we hate you guys more than you hate us, but also that the NFI, and I really hate the Falcons as a personal thing with that Mike Vick part, but there's a lot of parity, parity in the NFC South. And what has illustrated that more than anything, or should we say to the national media at least, is that there's never been a repeat NFC South division champion. Won't so, be this year. so it's oh, not – oh, wow. Okay. So there it is. Sorry, well, I was going to ask you, we were going to start off, and then we'll, we'll just go ahead and put it on Scott Mesozoic era uh, <laughs> to tell us what exactly – why is it 
Why do you say that so confidently? Because you have arguably the worst secondary in the NFL. Your offensive line went from pretty good to just, let's put it this way, you're going to be wishing you had last year's Falcon offensive line. That's Ooh, some bullshit. That oh, my hold God. On, hold on, hold on, hold on. Your starting left tackle is Nate Chandler. Your starting right tackle is Byron Bell. They're going to look worse than Lamar Holmes and Jeremy Trueblood did. They're just going to be awful. I don't see any saving grace with them. Now, Trey Turner might be good, but he's got to beat Gary Williams. I don't know if he's even going to do that, but he's he could be good. Khalil, Silatolu, if Silatolu goes down, that offensive line's done. You just got to pray. Three-step drops and quick routes. And then I don't trust your wide receiving core too much. Jericho Cotri is a number four. Jason Avant, at best, is a number three. <coughs> Calvin Benjamin should play tight end or H-back. Like, <laughs> Tyquan Underwood's a slot guy. Your best receivers are probably going to be Tavares King and Greg Olson. Joe, right, can I, can jump I in there, in Joe. Yes, okay. jump in there, Joey. Scott, you, you, know, you bring up some good points with question marks in the receiving core and question marks along the offensive front. Okay, you, you did suggest that we'll be doing a lot of quick uh, three-step drops to get rid of the ball so that we don't have to sustain blocks for extended periods of time. You're going to have to. Right. I counter that by saying I think this team is going to be built around running the ball as a top priority. For one, out of necessity, because of the question marks surrounding the pass blocking abilities of the line, and that is really the style that Ron Rivera would like to implement is a ball control, eat the clock up kind of style. That doesn't one, score a lot of points. Right, that doesn't score a lot of points because, one, they have that. They have the best front seven in football. And that. One of. One that, of. Well, one it of it can be argued that they are the, top the three. best. Top three. It can be. A, couple, I mean, you can make like, arguments. A little better. 49ers, like they're, they're 49ers are okay. Um, Seahawks are pretty good, but I think the Panthers have the best. But that's that's, you know. That's, that's neither here nor that's there, what I'm really. Saying, like, in that um, race. Yeah. I think that that front seven makes that backfield in the defense, the defensive backfield, that much better. Standing alone and just looking at the secondary as its own entity, there are lots of question marks. But when you throw it together with that defensive front and look at it as a unit, now you're talking a different story. You know, not as much, though. because Our defense is not man. one to drop back and play man coverage. We don't do a whole lot of man coverage. We, we don't do We're even in zone, though. Right. I mean, we rely... I, like White. I like Robert Lester. They're good players. I just hope you, your, your defensive coordinator isn't dumb enough to throw Roman Harper in there over Robert Lester because Harper can't cover. Uh, and I hope he... Mel, I hope he Mel, comes to jump in in that, more on that that coverage. Comment. Because that's where he's actually decent. Uh, jump in where? On the on the comment that he does not. He hopes that our defensive coordinator does not put does not put Roman Harper in the starting lineup. Essentially, that's what he suggested. Starting lineup. Yeah. What do you well, think about that? Do you, he just called a secondary trash? <laughs> well, <laughs> at the end of the day. 12 and 4, and I'm sorry, what was y'all's record last year? And that means nothing for this year, so let's. Well, it does when you're starting out. You can't come it, in with a trash record. It doesn't, though, because you don't have the exact same players you had last right, year. But you had no Sam yeah, all right. Well, here's a stat for you. Our wide receivers last year, how many catches did they average a game last year? So I don't because. Know, they're they're bored bored because they sucked. Well, they're going to be even better this year. Right. Uh, yeah, that's I just we beat the Falcons, but two times last year, and we upgraded where we were. All right. So you, you can't you come in and be in David and talking collateral at best, and then you lost chemistry. All right. Let me jump in here. Let me jump in here. Let me jump in. 
Let me jump in on the secondary concept here. Because let's start with this one premise that the secondary is worse than last year. That was what this started with. And I disagree. Well, I disagree. He lost my boy Captain Munnerlyn. How's it going to be better without him? My Captain Munnerlyn, oh, Captain, my Captain, by the way, was He's a midget. Boy, man. He was a midget. He was he a midget. Was... That I liked him because he reminded me of a Brent Grimes with no ball skills. All right, let me tell you who. Let me tell he you what. Tough. He'd get in somebody's face, but he couldn't catch a ball to save his life. That's why I, I love Captain Well, Munnerlyn. Captain Munnerlyn could catch a ball. Don't worry. Oh, yeah, every every yeah, oh, interception no. oh, he on. caught was for a pick six. Right. Nah, my man holds yeah, the record. Of Turner. No, well, that no. Pick no, no. six. Listen, listen to me, Scott. He holds the record for Carolina in pick six. He is yeah, tied for interception. He not, he ran back. Okay. Like he would only get like one or two picks a year and get like 12 to 15 knockaways because he can't catch compared to how good he is at running a no, pick. No, let me go ahead and tell you something about old Captain Compared Munnerlyn. Compared to Grimes, who would make an athletic grab and just... Wait a minute, you're saying we're worse because the guy you're trashing is no longer with us? That's that would, right. Yeah. No, I'm saying he's not Brent Grimes. He's a hell of a player. Just because okay. a cornerback can't catch doesn't mean he's not a bad cornerback. Oh, Captain Munnerlyn. designed to catch. They're designed Look, to make sure that the wide receiver doesn't catch the ball. Oh, Neither captain! Oh, captain! My captain, first of all, was a jockey. <laughs> playing football. Yes, <laughs> he was a jockey that played football. All right. Second of all, is that he was our number one corner last year. He is not a number one corner in the NFL. Right. He is a nickel back. He plays. Number he two. needs. He it's needs a, to play in the slot, really. He should. Number two. He did well with um. Who was the guy you guys had forever? Chris Gamble. Gamble. Yeah. He did real well with Gamble back there, helping him out. Okay, Which, but I disagree that he's he's just this nickel. He should have never been a number one, but he's a solid that's number. The, two that's the him. point. Is we tried to add, we put an undrafted free agent last year and Melvin White, a rookie in there, and he was our number one corner last year. We asked him to guard, we asked him to defend Roddy White. We asked him to defend um not Michael Crabtree, but who else who was uh, Mike, who? Bolden. Yes, Anquan Bolden. These guys, we asked, the idea that our secondary is diminished is not, I don't think, I think this is, that's the outsider view, and I'm going to tell you why exactly, is that you're going to point to this. You're going to say two things. You're going to say Roman Harper can't cover, right? You're going to say Thomas Deku is trash because he sucked for y'all, right? And because he can't tackle. Okay. Well, here's the thing. Here's where you guys did, it, where this goes different, is that first, Roman Harper last year was asked to play free safety a lot. And free safety asks you to play more coverage. Is that not right, Joey? That's not right at all. He wasn't asked to play free safety. Because no. they had Kenny Vaccaro playing. At times, he, Kenny Vaccaro got hurt. Kenny Vaccaro got hurt real late in the year, though. Against the Panthers. But, yes, and after talking shit. But here's the thing. is the, Okay. Um, <laughs> and they also played Raphael Bush more than they played Vaccaro. Or Roman Harper. Vaccaro. Roman Harper is not going to be asked to do coverage, uh, play coverage in Carolina. He's going to ask to come up in the box and tackle. He was asked to in New Orleans. I think he was. I think they put him up against a lot of tight ends and things like that. You're talking Next. about a Rob Ryan defense that uses its strong safety in the box almost every play, just like the good old LeBeau defenses up in Pittsburgh where it has a floating strong safety. That was Roman Hart. How about this? Ask me. Answer <laughs> this. Is Did you ask Thomas Deku to play strong safety at all last year? No, and he shouldn't have because he can't tackle. He was playing in free safety all last year. The entire season. He wasn't the turning his head around, and he should have. 
I, I think you guys it. played him. I, I don't his, think you guys played him at free the whole time. I thought his role they changed. Flipped when, the safety left and right, but he was always playing free. He may have come up a little bit more at times, but it was on like first and ten when they saw a double tight end formation because that signified a run. When you're playing, when you see 22 personnel, you're going to have the guy drop up. It's just common sense. You don't have two deep safeties against 22 personnel. Right, I thought, he seemed you, to get in the box more last year. Right, I he think that's, that's something that I, I thought, too, that his role sort of changed in the defensive scheme of things. He wasn't um, as free to, to roam the secondary. He was more involved. In, in supporting the run, and he's not built for that, for one. He's not really built for supporting the run. Um, no, he's not. He's more of a, a guy to play center field. I don't like him, by the way. I don't like Deku, by the way, because his stupid, ass, his stupid ass ain't changed his Twitter banner from Falcons yet. And he probably won't, because he hasn't been on Twitter in like seven months. Yeah, he probably won't be on it either because nobody's running to have anything to do. I messaged him on Facebook about it. I was like, come on, man. Change that shit. Um, but you're right, uh, Joey. His role, Joey, touch on that, is that did you guys ask him to do things that were not best fit for his strong his skill points? Set? Yeah, right. weren't his strong did he, did he, points. Like, make tackles off the edge right. On, right. On, a, on a run play? You know, like he should have because he was the free safety, and they run off the edge. And you know, the guy that they signed, Jamal Cheney, got blocked out of the play. So Thomas Deku had a free open tackle, and he just missed it. Yeah, we asked him to make tackles when he should have. Okay, but, but I, think right. also, I, mean, I think that's a fair criticism. I think also he the tackles all year. The 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 another factor would be. The porous run defense that you that he had in front of him, the you know the guys, the the offensive linemen were getting to the second level and beyond. So, but that, if you have a chance one on one with the running back to make a play, there's no excuse not to tackle him. Period. All right. Well, look. Yeah, here in Carolina, pass off of him and not wrap up, and that was right. a big. I mean, I can't argue that. I can't wrap argue up. that. What what defensive formation do you guys typically run in Atlanta? <laughs> That's really tough because with Mike Nolan, they run a little bit of everything. everything. <laughs> if it exists, they run it. If it's four two five, if it's three three five, two four five. Do you guys play a lot of man, or do you guys play a lot of zone? The corners play man on the outside, but the interior of the defense is a zone blitz defense. Mm-hmm. It's just a straight zone blitz. Linebackers coming up, defensive ends dropping. When you got four men down, when you got three men down, sometimes you'll have a defensive tackle drop back a little bit, or a guy will just be in there trying to eat a double team, which Corey Peters is not that guy, which is why they went out and got Paul Solei. Um, 340 pounds of get me out of you can't get me out of your way. Well, yeah, and it's so that they can move Peters from the one all the way over to the three and then have another three tech and John Babineau or have a pair of four techs and just have them line up straight up and eat double teams together. And that's where Tyson Jackson can come in and kind of move around on the defensive front too because he can go between defensive tackle and defensive end and play either pretty well. You can play any tech from about three to six. And that's where uh, Malachi Goodman and he are going to rotate, is they're going to be right there. And then on the other side, you're going to have Babineau and Hageman rotate a lot. And then in the middle, you're probably going to see uh, Corey Peters, Travian Robertson. You're definitely going to see big Paul Soliai. And then sure. you're going to see some formations where Peters goes out and Soliai goes out or, you know, uh, Robertson goes out. But the one guy who probably isn't going to make the roster this year that played way too many snaps last year is Prey Jerry. And they're oh, going to right. and they were signed him. Why did they resign him if you think he's not going to make the roster? Cuz they could have let him go. Well, what he got was a one-year veteran minimum contract with a roster bonus for every single solitary game. Oh, so if he doesn't make the roster 
That's he's making him a money. Yeah. He's making not yeah. a dime, but his right. but his training camp per diem right now. Right. Okay, so what I'm <laughs> hearing, uh, what I'm hearing is a bunch of names that are meaningless in the theory that your defense was terrible last year, and our defense ranked number two until number two overall. I'll just go ahead and say it. Right. So the <clears throat> point is, is this. We made two things happen last year. One, we gave, we made Ted Ginn Jr. look good. And he's not. I'm sorry, he's great on special teams, but he's not a good receiver. Number two, we made Mike Mitchell look like a damn pro bowler. And he struggled back there when he was playing the free safety, and then we shifted him to the strong safety where he jumped up in the box and got in the right role. So we bring in a lot of guys this year in the draft. We bring in Ben Wickeray, Ben Wickeray, Ben Sticky, Sticky Wicky. Wicky. Sticky Wicky. Sticky Wicky. Ben, ben Wickery. Yes. Yes. Yeah, All I had a, a, I had a great, great on that guy. I really like Ben A. He's probably your best corner right now, even over Josh a Norman and Anthony. Russo. No, um, right now we're running Melvin White, who played well last year at corner. Antoine Kaysen, who is a, is is pretty good. Former first round pick. Yes. And he was a number four in Arizona. Right. Of but course he Patrick, was, because they, they invested Peterson. draft picks. They invested at <laughs> Peterson. And, right. yeah, exactly. And when you invest, here, here's the thing, is there's real draft equity in guys. It doesn't matter how good they are. If you put a third-round draft, if you get, draft a guy in the third round, you're going to give him a year or two just by default. I don't give a shit what they say. Is like it's a competition and all of this jack or whatever. Is you know if you went out there and put a first round pick on somebody and then some guy outplayed him in camp, he you ain't sitting his butt. No, you're gonna so, give him every opportunity. Yeah, well, it depends. It depends. That's good. Good. Does it? No, it doesn't. Is that yeah, a few? It does. Three? Yeah, it does. Atlanta Atlanta had Paul Warlow outplay Akeem Dent not just in camp, but in preseason and even in some regular season games. And they finally sat sat Akeem Dent when Weatherspoon came back because they were like, this Warlow kid's pretty damn good. It doesn't really depend. Warlow wasn't drafted. Now Warlow's wearing the green dot. I think, I think his point is is that they they did keep letting Dent play trying to trying to prove that hey he can do it but then eventually into the regular season they realized that he couldn't so they did give him more than an ample opportunity because you yourself said he was out playing him in preseason and training camp so he's just saying that he you know with that first round pick there is you you will try to go over the over what you normally would trying to get him on the it's field it's not if you think it's a straight competition right Right. It's, it's, it's based it's, on camp. Some things are a little better about a real competition versus a fake one. I'll right. Put it there. Right. And right. It's, and it's angled. They try to angle it more toward the first round pick that he can be able to prove himself and get on there because he gets more reps. The top you know, three more picks. Time. The top the top three rounds are guaranteed mm -hmm. to be on the team. Although you might see Peter Kahn's get cut this off season. In Atlanta. Is that the center? That's the Is center. that the guy that went to jail? No. No, what guy he's a center. He, played, he played at Wisconsin with Karimi, right? Yeah, Karimi. Karimi will probably Karimi. make the roster. Hans probably won't. That's unbelievable okay. to me. All right, all right. We got to refocus here. <laughs> yeah. Let's refocus this discussion. Number <laughs> one. Training camp. We were talking about training camp. Instead, we got into a bitter rivalry between the Atlanta Falcons <laughs> and the Carolina Panthers. Um, and, 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 and let me and let me Scott let me say, Kutace just said he doesn't even hate the Panthers, <laughs> but he is mightily, confident. mightily ready, <laughs> confident. Exactly. All right. So here let we me, go. Let me take a break here and say that this is 
CarolinaCatChronicles.com. We are bringing you episode number one of Camp Chronicles 2014. And our guest tonight... Is, yeah, 30 minutes in. Our guest tonight is um, Draft Falcons editor-in-chief and founder Scott Karasik. And he has um, stated his opinion that he does not believe the Carolina Panthers will be the first team to repeat as division champs in the NFC South. And he is uh, strongly defending his position. And I don't want to—I don't want to seem like we're we're ganging up on it because it is three of us versus just him. And he's holding his own very well. But yeah, we are very—we are very passionate fans. And being, like being a passionate that. fan. Being a passionate fan, you can get sort of animated, I'll say. And please, don't anyone misconstrue this as, as us attacking Scott because it's not the case. We are sitting here and we're, we're giving everyone uh, equal opportunity to express Whatever, I feel attacked. I feel attacked. <laughs> 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 True what yeah, Joe said, to think that we might even like the Falcons because we don't. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, so it's Carolina Cat Chronicles, the C3... Camp Chronicles podcast, and what we want to know is this, Joe. What are we? What are we here to talk about? Just go ahead. Thirty-five minutes in. Thirty-seven minutes in. Thirty-five minutes in. We are here to talk about training camp 2014 with the Falcons and with the Panthers. We're here to get Scott's thoughts on uh, how the Falcons will do and how the Panthers will do. And basically, he's already told us what he thinks of our secondary. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> okay. Well, well, well tell us. You have probably no, 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 the best no, 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 no. in the NFC South. You've got probably the third best quarterback, or a tight end two, we'll say. Okay, what? okay. Uh, you've got the I, best tight end by far in the NFC South, outside of you know Jimmy Graham. Jimmy Graham, yeah, he doesn't really count. Whoa, 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 whoa! My man Graham, is on acid right now. Everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Third best quarterback. Everybody else. And then you got the best front seven in the NFC South by far. And you got right, one of I my don't favorite think that players, Quan Short, who yeah. should probably start over. I like Quan too. <laughs> I think he'll have a big year this year. Okay, really let do. me I ask you this. I think he looks at the job from Edwards. All right, because after he insulted our quarterback, and we could go on for 32 more minutes about that. No, because Meg Ryan, don't worry. Meg Ryan, don't you worry. Meg Ryan is as good as he will be. He will not be any better than he is. But tell us this. Tell us what's going on in Falcons camp. What are the stories wanna... coming out of there? Scott, I have one but... question in particular concerning the Falcons in training camp. Um, what is the status of Julio Jones? Julio's fine. They're just oh. doing a one day on, one day off to get his conditioning back up. Okay, so he is he is completely healed from his injury. He is he's just getting into sh working himself into shape. Or Smith are you going to draft him in your fantasy league, there, Scott? What? Are you going to draft Julio in your fantasy league? Depends on what round he's in. Uh, where would you draft him? Probably uh, late second, early third, depending on where I have a pick. Wow. I hear you. All right. All right. Well, because if he shows up the way that he looks in camp on the field. No, I agree. He I, think he's a I think he's a mid-second rounder in fantasy. He's Because he's a value pick like uh, Jimmy Graham was last year. I, had, I took Jimmy Graham in the fourth round of every draft I was in last year. Wow. And you were happy as could be with that return. I won three of the four leagues. Yeah, that go. shit ain't going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> hey, and who and <laughs> Jones ain't, ain't going to be, if he's a fourth rounder or third, Julio Jones is supposed to be the number one, bro. So if he ain't number one, if he ain't like in the realm, in the echelon of the A.J. Greens and the Calvin Johnson, I'm worried yeah, about his damn health. Good fantasy football players overthink injuries. That's what you got to remember. And I don't play with and they're not fantasy good football. football fantasy players. They need to just draft him because he's supposed to be awesome. Is he not awesome this year? 
that that's not the guys that I tend to play against. They're like these guys don't really have an NFL team. Like they'll claim to be Panthers fans or Vikings fans or whatever kind of fans they are. And I say Panthers because a lot of them are from Charleston, so they just claim the the hometown team. But they're like they don't care. They're just like I'm gonna take whoever's good. And yeah, like Greg Olson will go around too early, and Cam Newton will go probably in the third round normally. But other than those two, for the most part, the Panthers fans are a little bit lower on their guys than they are. We're talking about what are we talking about? I'm talking about Julio Jones. <laughs> and even Julio. Is my man a number one Julio. receiver or not? Is Josh Gordon hurt? went in the last round of our draft because mm-hmm. he was going to miss games. Yeah, same and in ours. Same in ours. So it happens. Okay, well, I, I want to ask. Let's if, not talk about fantasy. Let's talk Julio about Jones reality. Is a legitimate number one receiver in the company of A.J. Green. Um, I don't want to say Calvin Johnson. I think that's too much. Maybe Andre Johnson. Is he in that level? Brandon Marshall, Alshon Jeffrey. Is he up there with those guys? Yeah. In, in real NFL, not in fantasy I'm talking about. In the real on the NFL, field. you've got a top five receivers. And in those top five, you're going to have A.J. Green, obviously Calvin Johnson, obviously Larry Fitzgerald. You're going to have A.J. Green and that tier under those two with Julio and with Brandon Marshall. Okay. And then the next tier is going to be guys like Alshon Jeffrey and Crabtree out in San Francisco. And what about – okay, so you think he's right there. You think he's right yeah, there with, yeah. with that group. Okay. But Larry when, he's healthy, when he's healthy, yeah. Okay, so you you expect him to return to that level of play this year? I mean, yeah, because you normally don't break a titanium screw in your foot. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Because <laughs> that's what he did last year. He broke a titanium screw in his foot in the first quarter, played the rest of the game, and then at the end there he was like, "Man, my foot hurts," and they X-rayed it, and he they were like, "Well, you got to sit out the rest of the season." He was pissed. Right. He was like, no, I'll just take some painkillers for it. I'm good. I played the whole game on it. Okay. So so that's been repaired. He's healed up, and you expect him to have a, a, a Pro Bowl caliber year, close to it perhaps? If he's healthy, yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, yeah. So, hey, a question I got for you in camp. What What's going to be the backfield for uh, the loss of Gonzalez? Because I, I tell you what, Gonzalez was a man among boys. Um, it, it's a unique situation because you lose Tony Gonzalez, but you gain Devin Hester, so you get a unique weapon there. Um, you can't replace Tony Gonzalez. You can replace the production, but you got to do it with multiple players. So they've got Devin Hester, who they think they can do a lot more four wide receiver sets. They do really like Levine Toilolo as the starting tight end. There is no move tight end anymore, though. It's just a starting inline guy. And I would say Toy Lolo compares more favorably to a gumbied version, a stretched out version of Algie Crumpler than he mm. would really compare to a Tony Gonzalez. Really? That's he boxes guys out. He's not really fast, but he boxes guys out. He can get some separation up the middle. Yeah, Algie Crumpler had a little junk in his trunk. Yeah, he could box out. Yeah, you know, like you're saying. Algie Crumpler had a a lot of junk in his trunk. Really. <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord. An extended version, stretched out version. So just yeah, I got leaner, a leaner looks, algae crumpler. He okay. Looks, he looks like a uh, a tall, lean algae crumpler. Okay. Uh, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> As he can block and he can catch. <laughs> okay. But he's only gonna he's only gonna be able to catch like ten to fifteen yard routes at most. That's all it means. And he might, like, rumble down the field for a 40-yarder every, like, three seasons, but. <laughs> <laughs> so you're, yeah, you're not, you know, you're, I, right, you're losing something there. You're hoping to gain a little bit of that back with the addition of uh, Hester, who, who will be able to do something on offense. If nothing else, is scared of a Jesus out of, out of a defense and worried about him getting behind them with his speed. Uh, no, you're not going to worry about him in speed, but you are going to worry about him. You're going to put a couple guys on him in the red zone because he's six sorry, foot oh, seven. You can't teach oh, I'm that. I'm sorry. I'm talking about you Hester. You can't teach that. Yeah. 
Yeah. I'm talking about Hester. Um, oh, Hester, okay. you're hoping Hester will come in and sort of help to to make up some of that what you lost with uh, Gonzalez leaving. Oh yeah, and Hester will also be just a unique weapon. They're kind of hoping Hester's going to be basically what Anton Smith did last year with just actual other abilities. Right, and he's going to see some action in the return game, of course, right? Oh, he's going to be punt and kick returner for sure. And is he going to get any time? He'll get. He'll do most of his time in the defensive secondary with a little bit on the offensive side of the ball? What do you mean? As a defensive back? Hester? Yeah. No, no, no. No, he's not, going to any, he's not going to play any DB at all? Not any at all. Okay. The Falcons don't view him as a DB at all. No, no. They They've see him strictly as a weapon. Right. As a like Javier Arenas is the sixth best cornerback on the roster right now. He right, started out course. as a DB, didn't he? Yeah, he did. And he did, but he's not going to be one with the Falcons. Them. I got you. Uh, he ain't going to be a receiver either. Either either. He ain't going to be a receiver either because all my man is. He's like a better receiver with Matt Ryan throwing him the ball than he did with Jay Cutler throwing him the ball, though. No, yeah, I heard that him, That's I heard. Rules. Well, I did hear that him and Cutler did not get along at all. He and Cutler didn't get along at all, and he right. stays behind after practice and Cutler wouldn't. Right. He stays behind after practice in Atlanta, Matt's lobbing him balls. Right. I did hear that their relationship was very um, – but to say it was on the rocks in Chicago was putting it nicely. They really could not stand one another. That's because he's trash. <laughs> no, that's because Jay Cutler and Devin yeah, Hester didn't mesh. A right. guy from Vanderbilt and a guy from the University of Miami right. aren't right. going to get along very well. Right. It's two completely uh, different so guys. Like college rivalry, you're saying? No, no, just I'm not saying it's a college rivalry. You've got to be smart to go to Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt you Miami's do. all about football. Mm-hmm. Two completely different focuses on life. Right. And Cutler's a lot smarter than Hester, and they had no common ground. Matt so Ryan. Now, so now Hester is him. dumb, but he works on him? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, I'm saying Hester's focused on football. Cutler's right. got other interests, like his wife who is on the hills. Yeah, she's pretty smoking. I don't know if I can buy any of this talk right here. If, well, this all is, right, how about this? Is how that, long with his quarterback? That's a huge thing. If you guys are counting on Hester, I'm happy. Right. Second, y'all should be jumping can up and chatting down for Douglas. Make Devin Hester look good. Well, no, well, we'll see. No. I'm interested in seeing. I really am because, um, you know, he does have the speed. Hester's speed is scary speed. So and I am interested in seeing yeah, we better well, not get a punt return for you. Hester? Of course. That's why you pay him $3 million a year. Anything you get on top of punt and kick returns is great. That's where he scares me. As a receiver, he does not scare me at all. I think he is trash as a receiver, but he is world-class. He's, he's Ted Ginn Jr. He is Ted yeah. Ginn Jr. He's and so, hurt. all right, how about this? Is let's go in there. Let's go ahead and talk about the camp. We got 11 minutes. Camp. <laughs> You guys drafted uh, Matthews, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, Matthews. Mel, jump in there and tell us about Matthews for a moment, his dad and all that jazz. Well, yeah, he's son of Hall of Famer Bruce Matthews, of course, and you know, I, we always got to throw in Johnny Football somewhere. So in college he protected Johnny Football's blind side uh, down there at Texas A&M. So, uh, yeah, I, th I think he's a stud. I think he was a top three pick, should have been. Uh, fell down to the Falcons. I, th I think they definitely made the right choice there. I think if you were to be real critical and to say what made the Falcons suck as bad as they did last year was they were weak on the offensive line. They did lose Sam Baker. They were weak across the front line, and they were weak on the uh, defensive line. And Jake Matthews is going to help strengthen that for sure. And they did bring in some good uh, free agent picks. So I think they are going to be stronger this year. They're not going to take uh, the Panther spot at the top, but they are going to be better. I'm looking forward to seeing the – game week one when they take on the Saints. Saints yeah, me too. Me too. Scott, Scott Mesozoic, how much does Jake Matthews and his pedigree help you guys as a team? Well, let's put it this way. When you're starting Ryan Schrader by the end of the year at right tackle, an undrafted free agent who didn't look very good playing out there, you'll want someone who can play right tackle. 
but it's not just Matthews who's going to help the team. It's you get back Baker, hopefully healthy. If Baker gets injured again, you can at least move Matthews to the left side and not be like, oh my God, we're screwed. It's, oh, well, we're going to move Jake Matthews, a top six pick, to the left side of the field where his Hall of Fame dad played for his entire career. You know, hey, okay, we're putting this guy here, and he's going to be good. He looked good, you know, as a left tackle for Johnny Football who could never stay in the pocket. How is he going to look for a guy who always stays in the pocket? Right. You know? I so, think it's a no-brainer on the pick. They had to go with him. Yeah. Um, it addressed a huge need. Um, and that, combined with Asamoa, um, will definitely be a significant upgrade to the offensive line. Um, where will, okay, was Julio, I'm sorry, Roddy White paid what he was worth, or was he overpaid? The, the structure on his deal is just coming out now, and it's a lot more favorable than anybody really wants to give it credit. Um, you mean team-friendly? It's a lot more team friendly. It, Ten million dollars of it is this year money, okay. and then after this year, he's got cap hits of five and six million dollars a year. The only way he sees the ridiculous thirty million dollars that he signed is if he somehow magically catches a hundred balls a year for the next three years. And if he does that, then hell yeah, he's worth that money. Sure. If he does yeah. that, you guys are going to be very good in the next three years. Yeah, because yeah, if I he agree. does that, Julio is going to be doing that, and then the Falcons right. are going to be just destroying people. So, yeah, of course, you know, he'd be worth that money. But if he and doesn't do that, he's not worth the money. Too bad he's stupid and his quarterback went to Boston College. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh. <laughs> um, um, uh, I wanted to ask you breaking – I said breaking news, but I guess it's not really breaking news. But earlier today, uh, Stephen Jackson went down with a – hamstring injury, the other hamstring, not the one that he injured last year. Where does that put you guys in uh, your backfield? Where, where does that leave you? I mean, about the same, because I was expecting Jackson to go down at some point this year. <laughs> I, mean, I, wish I, could, I wish I was kidding here, but I'm not. Like, <laughs> right. you know, he's going down. It's Stephen Jackson. How's Devontae right. looked in camp? Devontae is a very, very surprisingly good player. No one was expecting him to be as good as he is right now. Um, oh. and I like Devontae Freeman a lot, but they weren't expecting him to be as quick or as intelligent as a run as a not run, as a pass blocker as he is. Oh, okay. That's usually a hard that thing. Was, that was normally yeah, that was noted as a weakness on a lot of the scouting reports from what I've been told and they're saying he's just jumping right in and he's studying with Matt. Like, hey, where are you going to be in the pocket on this one? Where are you going to be on the pocket for that one? And it works out pretty well. Okay. Well, maybe you've got a diamond in the rough there. Maybe somebody could step in and, and put, give you some production. Um, last year, defense was uh, 31st against the run, 135 yards per game. I think um, they were 33rd. They were what? I think they were 33rd in the league. <laughs> okay. Um, they were 35th, and I would have been like, yep. Right. <laughs> um, 135. Man, you graded us high. <laughs> how, how do you see them improving there? I mean, you know, I, we talked about who they're bringing in. How are they going to improve? When you got big, fat bodies who can eat up blockers so that Paul Warlow doesn't have a guy in his face every play, it helps out a lot. When you've got a big fat body in there, and you got multiple of them, and you know Babineau and Jackson and Soliai eating double teams, you're going to have clean linebackers. And the best way to stop the run is to keep your linebackers clean, force double teams in the run game. You know, have guys like Babineau penetrate, and if he penetrates in the backfield and a tackle is left with his head swimming, that's only good news. So the Falcons' run defense should be a lot more stout this year. There's going to be a lot more rotation. So You're not going to have solely playing 100% of the snaps. Right. You're going to rotate in Corey Peters and you know Rasheed Hageman at nose tackle. You're going to rotate in Hageman with Babino. Babino's not going to play 900 plays this year. Okay. You know 
Corey Peters isn't going to play 700 plays this year. These guys aren't going to play nearly as much as they did. OCU Manioria is not going to play basically rundowns this year because he's not a good run defender. And Jonathan he doesn't play at all. Ball. Jonathan Basker is taking the spot. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's not going to play at all. Okay, so let me get in here and ask you this. Is just tell us, what are the top three stories coming out of the camp, out of Falcons camp? Because there's a ton of stories coming out of Carolina's camp. The the big thing is how the offensive line looks improved because you're not going to start Lamar Holmes at left tackle or Peter Kahn's at center. So that's going to help the team out a lot. The other big story is – Steven Jackson going down with the injury. Gosh, that's not a big story. That I mean, that's just like normal. The Falcons camp, it's been a big story. Right. The other big story is the battle at free safety between um, Desmond Southward and Dwight Lowry. And they're saying it's a lot closer than it really – than anybody was really expecting at this point. They're expecting Lowry to kind of just run away with it. And Southward – Picking up the defense really quickly. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, look, this hour flew by because we were hating each other. <laughs> and, talking to John. and because Scott Mesozoic was just being crazy at some points. <laughs> uh, but let me tell you this, is that we have to make an announcement too, that right? We that we do. Um, Aaron, jump in there and tell us what you need to tell the crowds. Tell us right. what the announcement is what for nobody knows this look Scott Mesozoic doesn't know the Panthers no I'm just kidding uh, <laughs> and he doesn't know about the fan spotlight contest so tell him about it all right well hey Carolina Cat Chronicles man we're, we're real proud to be putting on something that I think is unique to any other website right now uh, we're we're picking a the fan spotlight winner of the week one week for every five weeks leading up to the start of the season. Uh, last week we had The Voice win the first week. Uh, great YouTube submission he put in, and we got four more winners coming up. Each winner receives a Carolina Cat Chronicles t-shirt. Um, Joe, are you wearing the t-shirt? You can show that Damn. off. Right on. That's a hot shirt. Um, you can also buy one online as well. But each winner wins that shirt, and then at the end of those five weeks, Panther Nation gets to vote on those five fans as the super fans to win tickets to the home opener against Detroit Lions, where my men, Joey and Tony, are going to be there, going to be tailgating with the winners. And the winner also gets uh, dinner for two at Firebird Steakhouse. So uh, some great prizes being given away. This week's winner, we had a lot of great submissions. Uh, you can go out there and submit again, and more people, please come out, submit, tell your fan story. But this week's winner is Twitter handle number one McNutt fan. Real name is Edward Miller. Now let me read you this story. I think this is awesome. This is his submission. We'll have it up on the website tomorrow. But this is what he said. I've been a fan since I was buying beer, which won brownie points right off the bat, in a store around 1993. Uh, the register had Carolina Panther bottle openers, and I said, what the heck? Uh, we're, we are getting a team. Uh, wh what the heck, we're getting a team? This was before the internet, you may remember. So I bought it, and ever since, I've been watching every game of the Carolina Panthers since I bought that bottle opener. Uh, I've seen the highs and the lows from beating the Cowboys uh, just to lose to Green Bay the next week. Uh, I watched Rodney Peach stink up, the, stink up the joint and thinking, here we go again, and then seeing a no-name backup uh, named Jake DeLone come in and save the season. I sat miser miserably in a chow hall in the Middle East watching and watching us implode against Seattle. I've, I've walked miles to find a TV where I could watch Panther games. The only season I've missed was the, the Clawson year, which, believe me, made nothing. Because he was in Afghanistan. Uh, I've gone on uh, to screaming for Rivera's head to be uh, – to being optimi optimistic uh, to proclaiming him to be the Panthers' greatest coach. So kind of gone through that. <laughs> so he went from one end 
went from I want wanting so God. He had the pitchfork. To call him the greatest. Score, so he is the greatest. Okay. He said, I've had uh, Chris Gamble jersey stolen from me uh, while I was on deployment. I was so pissed. And I've had people in sports bars ask me why I was wearing an 85 Walls jersey and who he was. Right? And he walked around, <laughs> he walked around Erickson Stadium, uh, but he's never been to a game. And this is the part I love, too. When we let number 89 go, my man, number one McNutt fan, flew hit the fl his American flag in his front yard at half staff for the day. <laughs> yeah, he's a Carolina, the Carolina Panther fan until the end. God bless America. That's right. God bless America. If you're a McNutt fan, you are the week two winner of the Carolina Cat Chronicles fan spotlight. Congratulations. Now you got some work to do. Now you got some work to do, though, and you got to go on the campaign because I know some other entries – that are ready to take that flag and raise it to full staff. There are some there are some awesome entries in there, and once you enter, you're eligible every week until the end. And you can enter multiple times. So just because you don't win it one week doesn't mean stop trying. That's right. Keep, keep plugging. Yep. Keep plugging. Keep, um, keep pounding would be the term. Keep, keep pounding. That's right. Keep pounding. Scott, okay, um, Scott. Um, yeah, go ahead and tell us how. Tell us. Thanks, uh, Joe. Yeah, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, you you did a great job. You represent Atlanta well. I don't think there's anybody in the business that knows more about the Falcons than you. I never met anybody that can make the Falcons look better than you did. So nice yeah, <laughs> for sure. I want to thank you for coming on, and um, I would like to have you back on again. Um, on the show during the weeks that we are playing the Falcons. I think you provide tremendous insight. So thank you for coming on. Sounds good to me. And uh, anytime. Love to come on anytime. Uh, Y'all can find me on Twitter if you have any Falcons questions, at Scott Karasik. Um, Sounds like Jurassic. It does. <laughs> um, you can also find a lot of my work on Bleacher Report or at Draft Falcons. Right. All, All right. right. Nice work, man. All right. Mel, tell them how they can hit you up. Hit me up on Twitter, at Panther Drafter. Uh, I'm also an analyst for Draft Tech, uh, covering all Panthers drafts. The, the new mock draft will be coming out in a few days, so go check out drafttech.com. And uh, you can always catch me here when I'm not traveling on Tuesday nights. Night. When he's not traveling. Keep pounding. My man travels more than anybody I know. Sure. Uh, Joe, Joe, jump in there and tell him what you want to hear. All right. I am Joe Riolano. You can find me on Twitter at Joe Riolano. Uh, it's cat underscore chronicles two. And um, also Facebook, Carolina Cat Chronicles on Facebook. Um, like us. We've got some stuff in the works coming up. Um, we are, we, we're looking at, uh, we filled up our fantasy football challenge, fantasy football league. Yay, Four, we did a great 48 job. 48 teams, brother. 48 teams. 48 and teams strong. That's right. Um, we've got a lot of mock drafts coming up. Please, if you're in the Carolina Cat Chronicles fantasy football challenge, make sure you get in a mock, at least one. Um, it will help you get through the process smoothly. So make sure you do that. All right. Well, this is the professor, CarolinaCatChronicles.com. You can hit us up at at cat underscore chronicles. Look, folks, C3 is bringing it every week. The podcast is taking off. The website, look at that. The website has been going crazy lately, and it's all because of you guys. And look. When I say you guys, I mean we guys. We're just fans. Look, my kid ran up and got Mike Tolbert's autograph. I mean, my kid is shy, too. I told him, I said, and I let me, and let me just digress for 30 seconds on this, on this outtake right here, is that my son is just old enough to start caring about things like football he doesn't really he'd rather talk about dinosaurs that's why I call Scott Jurassic the Cretaceous period anyway uh, <laughs> my son loves dinosaurs so we go to a fan fest and I told him I said 
I will buy you a Lego set if you get down in there and get me some autographs because they love the children. And I told him, I said, if you get me Cam Newton's autograph, I'll buy you the hundred dollar Lego set. I swear I said that. Tony's bribing his children. <laughs> My kid, Michael Dudd, worked so hard, brother, for all of those autographs. He brought me back Mike Tolbert. He brought me Trey Turner. So, look, we are you, and you are us, is that, look, we're just fans bringing it every week. So check us out. Bring it on, carolinacatchronicles.com. We got a lot of stuff coming up. Thanks, Scott, for coming on. Uh, I'm going to play a little music for us to go on out, and that's about it, fellas. Good night, Panther Nation. Right. I thought I had some music. Well, you were just kidding. Yeah.